My talk will be in three parts. Part one will be on abolitionism. Part two, the Civil War. And part three, Reconstruction. Before I go on, I want to acknowledge my debt to the three thinkers who are projected on the wall behind me. In case you do not recognize them, they are C.L.R. James, Karl Marx, and W.E.B. Du Bois. One recent count I saw said that there had been 90,000 books written and published on the American Civil War. I have not read all of them, but I have read a few, and I have learned from some of them. But they are the three who most shaped my thinking. First, abolitionism. The abolitionists began their work at a low point of the anti-slavery movement. The emancipatory sentiment of the revolutionary period had been stifled by the country's growing dependence on cotton and the general unwillingness of its citizens to imagine it with a large free black population. The Constitution placed slavery for all practical purposes beyond the reach of federal legislation. Slaveholders controlled the executive and judicial branches and half the Senate. Free black people lost what political and civil rights they had, were driven out of trades they once held, and became the target of mobs seeking to reduce all those of African descent to the status of slaves. Our analysis of the abolitionist movement must begin with the slaves. In 1820, Denmark Vesey led a revolt of slaves in Charleston, South Carolina. It failed, and its failure led the slaves to seek other means to gain their freedom. The Underground Railroad started around 1825. From the beginning, it was the work mainly of, free, of black people. In 1826, these people organized the Massachusetts General Colored People's Association. In 1827, Freedom's Journal, the first black-owned newspaper, was founded. In 1829, David Walker, a black man living in Boston, published an appeal to colored citizens of the world. It was regarded as so incendiary that possession of it became a crime in southern states. The first National Negro Convention was called in September 1830. William Lloyd Garrison published the first issue of his paper, The Liberator, on January 1st, 1831. Previously a supporter of the idea of colonizing free slaves out of the United States, Garrison had been worn away from that view by listening to black people. I want to read you now his now famous declaration. I am aware that many object to the severity of my language, but is there not cause for severity? I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. <laughs> Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has, been, it has fallen. But urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch. And I will be heard. Well, Garrison really had no idea how he was going to do away with slavery, but he was going to start. When he said he would be heard, he was not being rhetorical. That was his first problem, to be heard. Three months after he published his declaration, Nat Turner led an uprising of slaves in Virginia. It solved Garrison's problem. After that, he was heard. The Liberator became famous. Along with Walker's appeal, it was blamed for the insurrection and banned from the mails. Southern states offered a reward for Garrison, dead or alive. Walker had already died under mysterious circumstances. Some thought poison. The suppression of Nat Turner's insurrection produced a new wave of refugees from the slave system, expanding the black population in the free states. The black community was the driving force of abolitionism. 300 of the first 400 subscribers to the Liberator were black, 
and throughout its life, the movement rested heavily on black support. The revolting slave, the persecuted free black person, and the New England intellectual came together and forced the nation to face the slavery question. The New England Anti-Slavery Society was founded toward the end of 1831, and in 1833, the American Anti-Slavery Society, with a statement of principles written by Garrison. By 1838, there were 1,300 societies in the national organization with a membership of about a quarter of a million. The greatest strength was in New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Their work revolved around the efforts to petition Congress for the abolition of slavery. In 1837, they collected over 400,000 signatures. The societies fielded agents who traveled throughout the free states, speaking publicly, selling literature, and helping to form new societies. In 1833, the society hired 11 agents. They were supported by dues and contributions from members and sympathizers, and money raised at fairs, where crafts of various sorts were sold. Garrison and other well-known spokesmen typically spoke to crowds of 2,000 or more in abolitionist literature, including the Liberator and other newspapers and pamphlets sold widely. What did the movement stand for? First, immediate, unconditional, uncompensated emancipation on the soil. While most Northerners opposed slavery, they hated abolitionism more. Business interests depended on slave-grown cotton and sugar, and laborers feared the sudden appearance of the million former slaves in the labor market. The abolitionists meant to tear up by the roots Southern economy and society, wreck Northern commerce and disrupt the Union. Their steadfastness brought down on them the hostility of the state, the local police, and the best citizens. To get an idea of their radicalism today, Consider the prison. I would bet that most of you agree that as an institution, prison is a failure. Yet, how many of you would favor immediately opening the doors and releasing the inmates, unconditionally? The abolitionists proposed to admit four million people, largely illiterate and victims of an oppressive and degrading social system, into general society. The abolitionists not merely opposed the slave system, they acted to prevent its operation. Wendell Phillips, in my opinion, the real leader of the movement, frequently reminded Northern audiences that it was their taxes that paid for the armed forces that put down that term. All the slave asks of us, he declared, is to stand out of his way, withdraw our pledge to keep peace on the plantation, withdraw our pledge to return him, and he will write himself. At rallies, he asked his audiences to pledge never to return the fugitive who set foot on northern soil. He used to say that if he could establish Massachusetts as a sanctuary for runaway slaves, he could bring down the slave system. And he worked to achieve that aim by any means necessary. The slogan, no union with slaveholders, was a cause called for the North to secede. When Garrison stood up on the 4th of July, 1854, in Framingham, Massachusetts, and burned a copy of the Constitution, it was more than a symbolic gesture. Second, they stood for racial equality. This was not merely an ideal, but their answer to the main argument against abolition, the alleged inability of black and white to live together. In linking anti-slavery with civil, legal, and social equality, they were following the lead of black activists who rejected the American assumption that race prejudice was natural and insurmountable. Third, they stood for the rights of women. Like the demand for racial equality, this was not merely an ideal, but a practical stand reflecting their desire to bring to bear every possible force in the struggle against slavery. It grew out of initiatives on the part of abolitionist women. Fourth, internationalism. The masthead of the liberator carried the banner, my country, the world, my countrymen, all mankind. They denounced the Mexican War as a war to expand slave territory and work for the defeat of their own country. Fifth, 
a new view of politics and community. They renounced traditional politics, denounced all parties as corrupt, and denied the, uh, the authority of the Constitution. Phillips, the child of six generations of Puritans, declared at one point, thank God I am not a citizen. Although the movement was formally pacifist, they took part in the rescue of fugitive slaves, not only by underground methods, but openly by attacking courthouses where fugitives were held and seeking to release them. In 1849, when Frederick Douglass made a speech calling for slave insurrection, the Liberator published it in full. When anti-slavery forces sent arms to free state settlers in Kansas, Garrison asked, if such men are deserving of generous sympathy and ought to be supplied with arms, are not the crushed and bleeding slaves at the South a million times more deserving of pity and succor? Why not, first of all, take measures to furnish them with sharps rifles? Strange words for a pacifist. To give an idea of the sort of people they were, I can do no better than cite the example of Abby Kelly, a Quaker girl from Worcester, who, when she agreed to go on the road as an agent for the Anti-Slavery Society, traveling with Frederick Douglass, you can imagine the indignities that were inflicted on the two of them traveling together, she was forced to leave her infant daughter in the care of her sister. She said, nothing in my life ever gave me as much pain, but I did it for the mothers whose children are sold away from them. And her husband, Stephen Foster, not the songwriter. He used to enter churches every Sunday and denounce the minister and congregation as a brotherhood of thieves for their refusal to break with their ties with their southern co-religionists. Thrown down the church steps, he would get up, brush himself off, and go on to the next to repeat the performance. On one occasion, when the mayor of Boston begged a meeting of abolitionist women to disband because he was unable to protect them from a mob, Maria Weston Chapman, probably the person most responsible for directing the day-to-day -day work of the movement, replied, if this is the last bulwark of freedom, we may as well die here as elsewhere. And she led them, black and white, arm in arm, linked to a howling mob. I want to quote from C.L.R. James. The abolitionists argued over every comma of their doctrine with the utmost pertinacity and the unyieldingness, so much so that one well-wisher, after hearing an acrimonious debate, stated that to listen to the abolitionists abuse each other was a sure way to become an anti-abolitionist. <laughs> Yet despite the innumerable splits and the venomous controversies, the radical abolitionist was a man apart and recognized as such by his colleagues as well as by the rest of the population. Despite the acrimonious and recriminating character of their discussions and denunciations, they never at any time showed the faintest trace of that totalitarianism and degrading uniformity which characterizes the Communist Party. And, this is me talking, not CLR, if I may add, the cult of good think that prevails in liberal academic circles today. By 1838, some members of the Anti-Slavery Society had begun to argue that for the movement to succeed, it would have to shed its extremist image. Could try to murder my students for doing this. <laughs> Some members of the Anti-Slavery Society had begun to argue for that the movement to succeed, it would have to shed its extremist image. Garrison was an anti-sanitarian. He rejected the doctrine of original sin. He denied the divine authorship of the Bible. Perhaps most offensive, he advocated full equality for women, political, civil, social, and sexual. He did not seek to impose his views on the society. But on one point, he was inflexible, the right of women to take part in the society as full equals and to speak publicly on an anti-slavery platform. The latter as offensive to many as was the notion of racial equality. The controversy came to a head in 1840 when the World Anti-Slavery Congress in London 
refused to seat the female delegates from America. Garrison sat in the balcony with the women. At bottom, the dispute turned over whether the movement should try to make itself respectable. To sum up, abolitionism took, took shape in opposition not to slaveholders and open defenders of slavery, but to moderate elements within the anti-slavery camp. For several years, the contest between pro and anti-slavery forces stood still, until in the mid-1840s, war broke out with Mexico. From then on, slavery was the central issue in American politics. There were three main factions, the slaveholders, the abolitionists, and those whom we shall call anti-slavery, who opposed the extension of slavery into the territories, but sought to take no action against it where it existed. The shifting relations among them shaped the course of events through the Civil War and Reconstruction. Of the three, the abolitionists were the weakest at first. In 1850, congressional leaders worked out a compromise they hoped would bury the slavery issue. It succeeded for a while, but the fugitive slave wrecked it by making it impossible for Northerners to deny their complicity with slavery. Who could forget the lies upon the ice? In 1854, in yet another capitulation to the slaveholders, Congress passed an act opening Kansas to slavery, banned there by the Compromise of 1850. Pro-slavery forces poured in to influence the elections, while land-hungry farmers from the free states also migrated there. The result was a dress rehearsal for the Civil War. As I have said elsewhere, this, the secret ballot, the ballot box is a wonderful invention, but it's often decided by guns who gets to use it. The necessities of war compelled the free state settlers to make common cause with the abolitionists. And it was in Kansas that for the first time, John Brown's name became known. Time prevents my saying much about Brown. He was a Connecticut-born, Ohio-raised, pitch-pine Yankee descendant of Mayflower stock. Some today might call him a wasp, who at the age of 36 publicly vowed to dedicate his life to the abolition of slavery. Two things were distinctive about Brown. First, he not only worked for black people, he worked with them. Second, he was willing not merely to die for freedom, he was willing to kill for it. When conflict broke out in Kansas, he went there with his sons to take part. And there he inflicted on the slaveholders their first setback. <clears throat> and three years later, on October 16, 1859, Brown and a small band of followers, black and white, attacked the federal arsenal at Harpers Ferry, Virginia, with the aim of seizing arms and withdrawing into the surrounding hills from which they would conduct guerrilla warfare against the slave system. The attack on Harper's Ferry was not an aberration, but the logical implementation of the abolitionist strategy. The attack failed militarily, but it succeeded in other ways. For the six weeks between the raid and his hanging on December 2nd, Brown was the focus of national attention. Millions, including many who thought his act ill-advised, cheer his courage and acknowledge sympathy for his goal. Thoreau declared Brown the reincarnation of the 17th century Puritan hero, adding he did not go to the college called Harvard. He was not fed on the pack that is there furnished. <laughs> Emerson said Brown's hanging would make the gallows as glorious as the cross. As usual, Phillips saw farthest. In a speech at Brown's graveside on December 8th, he said that Brown had abolished slavery in Virginia. You may say this is too much. History will date Virginia emancipation from Harper's Ferry. True, the slave is still there. So when the tempest uproots a pine on your hills, grows green for months, a year or two, still it is timber, not a tree. Virginia, he continued, did not tremble at an old gray-headed man at Harper's Ferry. They trembled at a John Brown in every man's conscience. Brown, he said, 
startled the South into madness. These don't necessarily relate to anything, they're just things that people make. <laughs> Think about that. Brown startled the South into madness. The slave owners reacted to the raid with fury. They imposed a boycott on northern manufacturers, demanded new concessions from the government in Washington, and began preparing for war. By the arrogance of their demands, they compelled the people of the North to resist. But for the national discussion touched off by Harper's Ferry, it is unlikely Lincoln would have been elected. But for Lincoln's election, the Civil War would not have broken out when it did. What Brown did amounted to creative provocation. He provoked the slaveholders to act in ways that alarmed even moderate Northerners. The slave system bred rebellion, which provoked repression, which led black people to leave the South, which gave rise to a black community in the North, which was the basis of abolitionism, which engendered John Brown, who provoked held forward by the excesses of reaction applies universally. Would there have been a French Revolution had Louis XVI granted the moderate demands of the assembly instead of attempting to, divert, to disperse it? That brings me to the end of part one of my talk, the abolitionists. I shall now move to part two, the war. I do not intend to address the military aspects of the war except insofar as they reflect the politics. It's a slide that was made for me. The war aim of the South could not have been simply secession, the formation of a separate country, as has usually been taught. The war aim of the South was to reconstitute the Union on the old basis, with the protection and expansion of slavery as the avowed national purpose. The ultimate goal being the formation of a slave republic, modeled on ancient Rome, extending from Canada to Brazil, and including as its auxiliaries the agriculture, commerce, and manufacture of the North. Southern leaders made their purpose clear as when the Confederate Secretary of War predicted that before the Civil War ended, the stars and bars would fly over Faneuil Hall in Boston. Phillips, who had fought for this union for 30 years, hailed the outbreak of war. His task now was to transform it into an anti-slavery war. The first obstacle was the Republican moderates. Lincoln was elected on a platform of banning slavery from the territory. He took office doing everything he could to avoid war, reiterating his pledge not to touch slavery where it existed, promising only to defend the Union. Among his first acts was to issue an order for strict enforcement of the fugitive slave law. His efforts were not enough to reassure the South, and the war began with, in the words of Frederick Douglass, both sides fighting for slavery, the South to take it out of the Union the North to keep it in. It cannot be overstated. I find this particularly relevant at this moment. It cannot be overstated that neither side was more or less committed to white supremacy than the other. Yet within two years, a battle over states' rights and union was transformed into a revolutionary war to abolish slavery. What brought about the change? It was not the success of the abolitionists in winning people to renounce color prejudice, but the fact that the war confronted millions of people with a choice, turn it into an anti-slavery war or accept the domination of the Southern system everywhere. And that they could not do. Here is an excerpt from a speech Wendell Phillips delivered in Washington in 1862. Gentlemen of Washington, you have spent for us $2 million per day. You bury two regiments a month, 2,000 men by disease without battle. 
You rob every laboring man of one half of his pay for the next 30 years by your taxes. You place the curse of intolerable taxation on every cradle for the next generation. What do you give us in return? What is the other side of the balance sheet? The North has poured out its blood and money like water. It has leveled every fence of constitutional privilege, and Abraham Lincoln sits today a more unlimited despot than the world knows this side of China. What does he render the North for this unbounded confidence? Show us something. Or I tell you that within two years, the indignant reaction of the people will hurl the cabinet in contempt from their seats and the devils that went out from yonder capital, for there has been no sweeping or garnishing, will come back seven times stronger. For I do not believe that Jefferson Davis, driven down to the Gulf, will go down to the waters and perish, as certain groups mentioned in the Gospel did. I quote this speech for two reasons. First, to demonstrate the quality of public discourse at that time, a contrast with the soundbite culture of the present. Second, to point out the freedom of speech that Phillips enjoyed when the Union was in far greater peril than it is at present, with enemy armies 90 miles from the federal capital and the federal army in the command of a general, McClellan, whose loyalty was in serious doubt. Over the winter of 1861-62, five million people heard Phillips speak or read his speeches. And by the way, excuse me for this shameless plug, or on the table there, there is a book of a collection of Philip's speeches that I edited. It's the only current collection of Philip of speeches in print. <clears throat> he called upon Lincoln to take three steps. One, turn the war into a war against slavery. Two, enlist black soldiers. Three, adopt an active military policy. Writing from London, Karl Marx advocated the same measures. And I'm going to quote you from a letter that Marx wrote. From the outset, the Northerners have been dominated by the representatives of the border slave states, who were also responsible for pushing McClellan to the top. The North itself turned slavery into a pro instead of an anti-Southern military force. The South leaves productive labor to the slaves and could thus take the field undisturbed with its fighting force intact. That there was no strategic plan is evident if only from the maneuverings of the Kentucky Army after the capture of Tennessee. In my view, all this is going to take another turn. The North will, at last, wage the war in earnest, have recourse to revolutionary methods, and overthrow the supremacy of the border slave statesmen. One single black regiment would have a remarkable effect on Southern nerves. Continuing Marx, the Northwest and New England wish to and will compel the government to abandon the diplomatic war they have waged hitherto. If Lincoln doesn't give way, which he will, however, there will be a revolution. The long and short of it is, I think, he said, that wars of this kind ought to be conducted on revolutionary lines, and the Yankees have so far been trying to conduct it along constitutional ones. It was not the words of Phillips or Marx, persuasive though they were, but the exigencies of war. For the first year, the North was losing, in spite of its overwhelming superiority in population and material. Gradually, under the pressure of events, Lincoln moved in a new direction. The shift was embodied in three measures. The Emancipation Proclamation, the enlistment of black soldiers, and the appointment of Grant as head of the Union armies. The war entered its revolutionary phase. The Emancipation Proclamation actually freed no one, since it applied only to those areas of the country then in rebellion, that is, to those areas of the country where it could not be enforced. But it was important as a statement of purpose and encouraged what Du Bois called a general strike against the Confederacy. An estimated 200, that is the withdrawal of black and white labor from the plantation system. An estimated 200,000 black soldiers served in the Union forces. According to Lincoln, they meant the difference between victory and defeat. Frederick Douglass recorded a conversation he had with Lincoln shortly after the proclamation. 
I agreed to, young, to undertake the organizing of the band of scouts, composed of colored men, whose business should be somewhat after the original plan of John Brown, to go into the rebel states beyond the lines of our armies and carry the news of emancipation and urge the slaves to come within our boundaries. Once again, Marx proved prescient. Quote, the slave states are sparsely populated, with few large towns and all these on the seacoast. The question therefore arises, does a military center of gravity <coughs> nevertheless exist, with the capture of which the backbone of their resistance will be broken? Cast a glance at the geographical shape of the secessionist's territory with its enormous wedge into their territory, separating the states on the North Atlantic Ocean from the states on the Gulf of Mexico. The sole route that connects the two sections of the slave states goes through Georgia. With the loss of Georgia, the Confederacy would be cut into two sections, which would have lost all connection with one another. And that is, of course, what happened. As Sherman, with Grant's approval, advanced into the South, the slaves rallied to his banner, and the Confederacy collapsed. Farmers and mechanics, who had never dreamed of going to war to free others, human beings rarely do such things, joined free black people and former slaves in a great army and marched across the land, singing to the tune of John Brown's body, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. Southern non-slaveholding whites played an important role in bringing about the downfall of the Confederacy. This, by the way, is part of the hidden history of the American Civil War. Resisting the draft and deserting in large numbers, 300,000 fought for the Union. The 1st Alabama Cavalry Regiment, made up entirely of white Southerners who opposed the Confederacy, served as Sherman's personal escort. Fired by hatred of the slaveholders, they were responsible for a great deal of the destruction along the route of the march. The alliance between those who owned thousands of acres and hundreds of people, and those who eked out a hard scrabble existence on the poorest land, was unstable and could not endure. And in this connection, I urge you to see the film of the Free State of Jones. It was not the North that freed the slaves, but rather the slaves and free black people who freed the country from the domination of the slave system. Each step led inexorably to the next. Southern land greed, Lincoln's victory, secession, war, and the overthrow of slavery. I want to close this section of my talk by quoting from Lincoln's second inaugural address. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, still, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. I ask you to think about his statement. Let me read it to you again. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Has any statement ever captured more succinctly the meaning of the revolution. He was willing to destroy all the wealth that had been accumulated by an unjust system and to shed as much blood as necessary in order to bring about a better world. The Lincoln who spoke those words was not the moderate who came to office four years earlier seeking to maintain the union at almost any cost. Revolution is a process, 
Not a single event, and millions, including Lincoln, were transformed by it. That concludes my discussion of the war itself. I now turn to the period after the war. On this, I am indebted, above all, to W. E. B. Du Bois' work, Black Reconstruction in America, which even 80 years after its publication stands by itself. It is, in my opinion, the book that every American should have his nose rubbed in, as Bernard Shaw said about Ulysses and the Irish. <clears throat> du Bois' book is so comprehensive, and my time is so limited, that I shall attempt to do more than identify a few highlights. <clears throat> Barely had the war ended when southern states sought to restore slavery in all men and all but men, while returning to their union, to the union with their voting power enhanced, since the former slaves, who had previously each counted for three-fifths of the man, would now count for a whole. Votes for slaves was the response. Like many revolutionary measures, it was planned, not improvised. If I might digress for a moment, driving in here from Central Mass, Gwen and I were listening to uh, Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier, which of course revolutionized Western music. And it occurred to us that Bach did not pre-plan that. It was an improvisation, something he did simply in order to make it easier for him to transpose and play the music. Well, Votes for Slaves was an improvisation like that, spurred by the intransigence of the reactionaries. And with it began the period of radical reconstruction. Du Bois called the era of black political power in the South one of the most extraordinary experiments of Marxism that the world before the Re Russian Revolution had seen, a dictatorship of labor. In a revealing footnote to chapter 10, he commented, I first called this chapter the dictatorship of the black proletariat in South Carolina. He finally settled for a more restrained title but continued to insist that South Carolina showed tendencies toward a dictatorship of the proletariat. Was he justified in doing so? Read as a formula for public ownership of the means of production, the label is misapplied to the Reconstruction governments. There was very little of that. If it is taken more generally to mean the rule of the property of his class, there is a great deal to be said for using it to illuminate tendencies, not fully realized, tendencies in the Reconstruction governments. Reconstruction in South Carolina abolished property qualifications for holding office, apportioned representation based on population, not property, did away with imprisonment for debt, founded the public school, extended rights for women, built asylums for the insane and the handicapped, and modified the tax structure. A program of this sort, carried out against a mass, against a background of mass movement, may not yet be communism, but it is no longer capitalism. A speech made in Tallapoosa County, Alabama, by a man named Alfred Gray, showed the character of the movement. Gray was speaking at a meeting on the eve of elections for the state constitution, scheduled for February 4th, 1868. The constitution, I came here to talk for it. If I get killed, I will talk for it. I am afraid to fight the white man for my rights? No, I may go to hell, my home is hell, but the white man shall go there with me. My father, God damn his soul to hell, had 300 Negroes and his son sold me for $1,000. Was this right? No. I feel the damned spirit of damnation in me and will fight for our rights until every rascal who chased Negroes with hounds is in hell. Remember the 4th of February, and everyone come in and bring your guns and stand up for your rights. Let them talk of social equality, mixed schools, and a war of races. We'll fight until we die and go to hell together, or we'll carry this constitution. A speech like that made by a legislator who serves in a militia of the propertyless class is a sign that we are no longer talking about a bourgeois parliament. And by the way, as a footnote to this, his son, Ralph Ray, his grandson, 
60 years later, Ralph Gray was a leader in the movement to organize Alabama sharecroppers. He was murdered by the Klan in 1931. The real story of Reconstruction was the actors. Of 124 members of the South Carolina Constitutional Convention, 76 were black. Of these, 57 had been slaves. 59 of the black and 23 of the white delegates owned so little property that they paid no taxes, whatever. Was either the Paris Commune or the Petrograd Soviet of pure proletarian composition than the South Carolina Convention of 1867? <clears throat> Taken together, the Civil War and Reconstruction were a revolution as great as any in history. In a short time, it transformed property into citizens, voters, and officers, office holders. Neither the English Revolution of the 17th century nor the French of the 18th involved so many people or such great armies as did the North American Civil War. Neither the Russian nor the Spanish Revolution of the 20th century hurled so high people who had been so low. Only the Haitian Revolution of the 18th century and the Chinese Revolution of the 20th approached the American in breadth and depth. And in neither did the downtrodden participate directly in exercising power for so long as did American slaves after the Civil War. Although the abolitionists did not realize all their hopes, neither did they disgrace with their deeds the cause for which they had fought or leave a stench in the nostrils of later generations, as did many of the revolutionaries of the next century. Time prevents me from addressing the fall of Reconstruction and its causes. It did not fail, as some have said, it was drowned in blood. But I will say that the era of the Civil War and Reconstruction represents the greatest and most sustained advance in democracy the country has seen to date. And that, as Du Bois wrote in 1935, the rebuilding, whether it comes now or a century later, will and must go back to the basic principles of Reconstruction in the United States during 1867 to 1876. Land, light, and leading for slaves, black, brown, yellow, and white, under a dictatorship of the proletariat. Thank you for your attention.